Lucid moments with her are fewer and far between. She is, but I'm not, forgetting who she used to be. God, tell me what to do when you lose a person who is still standing in front of you. Dear God, please don't take her away from me. There is still so much in life she has yet to see. Like true love, nephews and nieces, and things with time like old age creases. Dear God, please allow her just one more turn to take back her life and learn that she is here for a reason, that this cold weather is nothing but a passing season. Show her clearer days could be found ahead, but none of this is possible if she is first found dead. God, you have shown me the devil lives in this powder, and if you can't hear my plea, I promise to pray louder. Welcome to episode 27 of Unscripted. I'm your host, Nell Daly, psychotherapist, journalist, TV commentator, and mother. And you've just heard the voice of author and award-winning activist, Alicia Cook, reading a poem she wrote about heroin addiction. The best way for us to stay in touch with you is through social media. So let's be friends. Come follow us over at Nell Daily on Instagram and Facebook at Nell Gibbon Daily. You can also email us at Nell at the Daily. That's T H E D A L Y with feedback or show suggestions. We're totally open to that. And we're also always looking for brand partnerships that feel aligned. So if you are feeling called to work with us, you can email Michael at the Daily and he'll hook you up and answer all of your questions. We've heard a lot in the media about the heroin problem that's sweeping the United States. For those of you who don't know much about it, here is a little crash course. When I was in college, you didn't hear much about heroin. You also didn't hear much about Xanax or things like Prozac. They were still, there was still actually, um, how do I say this, a pretty big taboo against taking psychiatric medications for depression and anxiety at that time. And that was the late 1990s. But by the time I finished my clinical training and became a licensed psychotherapist, which was about six years later, we were actually being taught to diagnose and then most of the time recommend a psychiatric consult for medications for anything and everything under the sun, PMS, postpartum depression, insomnia, panic attacks, chronic fatigue, agoraphobia, bipolar one and bipolar two, you name it, we tried to medicate it. This snowballed and became a vicious, vicious cycle. Big Pharma pushed the drugs through doctors and slick advertising campaigns, and doctors made tons of money prescribing these drugs. In the town where I practice mostly, which is New York City, doctors were charging 500 plus an hour for sometimes just, to be honest with you, sometimes just even a half hour to 15 minute session, and they were getting paid that kind of money. I worried privately about the ethics of all of this, but I was told over and over again there was science behind these drugs and that these drugs could help make people's lives better. So why have them suffer needlessly when there was a little pill we could give them? Let me just give you a little example. After 9-11, I remember a few patients coming to me asking if I thought that they should get a script for Clonopin for upcoming plane rides. That seemed reasonable to me. Most of us were afraid to fly after 9-11, especially if you were from New York or Washington. At that point, doctors were still just giving out one or two clonopin at a time, maybe a little Xanax, just to get you through the flight. A few years later, I had patients coming to me and some very close friends who were disclosing that they were taking Xanax twice a day. When you question their usage, they would say something like, yeah, but my doctor told me it was just the smallest dose, so it doesn't really matter or it barely counts. Opiates were becoming a huge issue as well. I heard colleagues whispering that too many people were addicted to a drug called Oxycontin, which most of us have all heard of at this point. This became like a perfect storm. Let me make some things perfectly clear. These drugs were never studied for long-term usage. Patients were never properly briefed on side effects, and they were never fully warned about what's called the tapering effect. I've seen patients not only suffer more when they take the drugs, getting them off, which is called tapering, is often scary to watch, 
especially benzos and opiates. Here's another quick stat. One study found that using benzos for six months on a regular basis gives you a 40% more likelihood of early onset Alzheimer's. According to the CDC, 91 Americans die every day from opiate overdose. The amount of prescription opiates sold to pharmacies, hospitals, and doctors' offices nearly quadrupled from 1999 to 2010. Yet there has not been an overall change in the amount of pain that Americans reported. Deaths from prescription opiates have more than quadrupled since 1999. So I just want to go back to the Alzheimer's con, uh, statistic really quickly. Many people complain that when they take these drugs like, you know, a Xanax or a Clonopin, that they are foggy. And that definitely has to do with the fact that it causes some uh, amount of memory loss. Another CDC study found that people who use prescription painkillers are 40% more likely to use heroin. So there you go. We used to say that pot was the gateway drug. I don't know how many of you guys remember this, but there was that famous slogan during the Reagan years. Now we know that pain medications are the gateway drugs to heroin, and psychiatric medications that also dull mood and pain are like this, what I call, second wave of drugs compounding the problem. As one of my teachers, Frances Weller, says, we're a culture that is obsessed with amnesia and anesthesia. My guest today is Alicia Cook a New Jersey native, writer, and activist. She's going to tell us the story of her cousin, Jessica, who tragically died of a heroin overdose when Alicia was in college. Alicia and Jessica's story mirrors the stories of so many other American families. A talented writer with an enormous heart and a huge amount of energy realized after her cousin had died that there wasn't really a voice out there for families struggling with heroin addiction. And she wanted to be that voice. At this point, over 1.2 million people have read her poetry and essays. She covers so much of the human condition in her work, not just addiction, which, may, which makes it very compelling reading for anyone going through anything. Her work is what she likes to call a mixtape. And I would agree with that. Without further ado, the open-hearted and brave Alicia Cook. So, Alicia, it's so wonderful to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. I'm excited. Can you tell me about your story, how you came to work in the area of addiction recovery centered around heroin? Sure. Well, what I've learned since being in it is that nearly everyone that is involved in recovery, addiction, treatment, advocacy has been touched by addiction personally. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's my story. I lost my cousin, Jessica Cook, when we were um, very young, she was 19. And I had just turned 20. She died from a drug overdose. And one of our last conversations revolved around her situation and how how dire it had become. And she really didn't think that she was going to, to make it out of her addiction. And we were both very artistic growing up and she was a writer as well and loved, she actually got me into poetry um, when we were younger. And so she said, if this can't all be for nothing, if I don't make it out of it, can you, can you write about it? Mm -hmm. And at 20 years old, I, I was still naive and I said, you well, you're going to make it out. This is a ridiculous conversation. You're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, sadly, six weeks later, she died. And about six years to the day of her death, I began blogging about addiction. So you grew up with this cousin in suburban New Jersey. Yeah, she she lived in Morris County. And I grew up between Essex um, and Ocean County mm -hmm. in New Jersey. And how did she start to use heroin? 
she obviously was in high school when she started using heroin. Yes, we we discovered that she um she was using she was probably definitely 17 if not a little before that. Um it started with pills. It started with her hanging around older people that were experimenting with pills and subsequently harder drugs and she very quickly moved on to heroin. Um so yeah, she very quickly moved on to heroin and um from when we discovered her addiction to when she passed away, it was about an 18 month span. So it was, it was pretty quick. Mm. And, and she, did, was she in a relationship with someone who introduced her to heroin? Do you know how she yeah. got yes. involved in the pills and in, in the heroin? Yes. She, she started hanging around um, a group of older people. Um, I guess back then they were in their early twenties or so. And she was about, 17 so um she started dating someone that uh, I don't like to talk about because I don't like to give him any kind of recognition or anything like that but he did introduce her to drugs and they they both were basically on this crazy downward spiral she overdosed and died and from what I understand he's been in and out of jail is still alive and has procreated and now has a child mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um did did was was heroin when you were growing up? I know you and you're how old now? I'm 30 now. So you're 10 years younger than I am. Was heroin on your radar screen at all when you were growing up? Or it's, was this was this sort of like a drug that cuz this was 10 years ago now. Was this a drug that you knew kids were doing or was it still sort of hidden in the shadows? Heroin was still still had a a much thicker I like to say stigma attached to it. However, my generation back 10 years ago when we were 19 and 20, um, I was, pills were very prevalent. Mm -hmm. And And what kind of pills did you see kids using? Opioids, Mm -hmm. Percocets, Roxy's, Oxy's, Mm -hmm. uh, Xanax, Mm -hmm. uh, which are chemical cousins to heroin we have since realized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course. And so she, as many, I hear many patients start to use, many patients that I've had has started to use heroin and drugs because of the, they're involved in an interpersonal relationship where they get introduced to them and the drug use gets wrapped up into that relationship. And yeah, I think teenagers in particular are susceptible to that. Absolutely. As we all know, right? Yeah. And so your journey then, this is incredible to me, having a journalist and art degree in my background as well, besides being a clinical social worker and a psychotherapist, you are this creative. And so your cousin passes away. Tell me, where were you when you found out she passed away? How did you find out? And what was your initial response to her death? I was in my Shakespeare, my Shakespeare two class. That's incredible to me. In college, and it's so poetic at I, this point, right? It, it's poignant when I think back because for a very long time I didn't discuss. It was ten years her her ten year anniversary of her death just passed in September, and that was when I finally told my family, my aunt and uncle, which her parents, even about our last conversation. I always kept that to myself mm-hmm. because I felt like they needed hope. You know, I wasn't going to run when she was alive and tell them Jessica thinks she's not going to make it out. What do we do? like? I didn't want to take that hope from them. Mm-hmm. And I kind of just kept it to myself. I didn't I didn't tell anyone but my own mother. Um, mm-hmm. So then we're we're sitting I'm sitting in my Shakespeare two class. And back then you had flip phones <laughs> mm-hmm. and my cell phone kept ringing. And also back then you only used your cell phone to communicate text or phone call. And I had seen that my father was calling me and he called me twice. And even to this day, my father very rarely calls me. Mm -hmm. And I just had a a weird feeling, but I didn't think anything about Jessica, honestly, because last I had heard she was in rehab for a very long time and the program was working and she was doing well. Um, So she was in rehab up until 24 hours before she died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I get a call from my dad. I finally take it. And he said, Jess is gone. 
And I had, a, I just assimilated that with her running away. So I thought she maybe ran away from the rehab or something because she had disappeared a couple times. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, do you mean she ran away? Like, what's going on? He said, no, Alicia, she's gone. And his emphasis on the word gone, the way he said it, I knew he meant that she was, she had passed away. And then I hung up the phone. He told me to drive safe. Um, I hung up the phone and I went back into class and I finished the class. Right. I'm sure in a state of shock at that point. I, I think I was because I, I, all I remember then is I got, I got physically ill once I left class by my car outside. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I drove home and, and then the, the four or five days to follow were very, very hard to, to bear witness to, not even for my own pain, but what I, what I saw my aunt and uncle go through in those four or five days was something that I can't unsee. Mm -hmm. And how old were you at that point? You were 19? I was, I was freshly 20. Jess was 19. We were born 10 months apart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now I'm 10 years older than her, which is something that has been weighing on me lately, the fact that I'm a whole decade older than her now. And that she didn't – She, th what you're saying is that she stopped aging at that point in her life because she passed and you've continued on. Yeah, and I've been a, a polarizing at times parallel to my aunt and uncle because we were so close and had so many similarities. And and now I've, I've just – I've continued on my trajectory and in the, especially in the beginning, I know it was very hard for my, uh, definitely my aunt to uh, – to, to see that because it's almost like the question that keeps coming up is, well, why did this happen, have to happen to her? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As you've continued through your – progressing through your life stages and they don't have their daughter anymore to do that with. Correct. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I – no, she doesn't – my aunt doesn't go to bridal showers. My uncle cannot stay in weddings during the father-daughter dance. It's just – it's 10 years and it just, it still never gets easier, especially, I can't even imagine for parents. So the genesis of my work is I speak about my cousin in the beginning, I would just write about her, but I realized once such a warm reception happened to my work on jet, my writing on Jessica, I realized like I need to speak about what the families who love someone struggling with addiction go through because there wasn't a voice for that. Mm -hmm. So you gave voice to their pain. So can you tell the listeners what you did? Did you, it, and creatively in terms of your process, did you start writing? A lot of people heal through writing. A lot of people journal, and that's the way they work out their feelings. It's an incredibly healthy thing to do. As a creative person, did you turn to the your pen and paper to process what had happened? Or for some artists, that kind of trauma stops us from creating anything for a while? No, pain fuels my work, um, whether I'm writing about addiction or not, mm -hmm. much to my father's upsetness sometimes. But <laughs> Why? Because he wishes you, you wouldn't reveal so much on the page? Not reveal, no. I mean, my family, I've been writing since I was eight years old. My family knows that everything's fodder and I'm, I'm respectful. Like I understand, I just, it's understood what I could write about and can't write about. But just like if I write about old relationships or something like that, my father always says, I wish you would write something happy. Right. I forget um, what poet said it, but writers live twice. They 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 live when they actually experience the moment and they live it again when they write about it again. And I love that phrase that we really are people who live life twice over, those of us who write. So you took you took this experience and you started writing about it right away. Privately, I wrote about it right away. Mm -hmm. I kept journals back then. Um, I had an old, like an older laptop and she passed away in 2006. I journaled probably the rest of college and I did write one poem almost within a couple months of her death that, that my college poetry magazine published mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I started writing, um, I guess in 07, I started just blogging to myself almost like in that style. Um, and I saved everything. I didn't publish any of it to this day. It's still not published. And, um, I wrote about 75,000 unpublished words on my cousin just to work out what was happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, and, uh, and that's amazing. And then so prolific. And then when did you start actually putting your work out there? 2014. Amazing. And what what was your medium to get it out there? What did you first start using? Just I, a blog? 
I use the blog and then um, Thought Catalog, Elite Daily, and local news, uh, New Jersey newspapers started mm-hmm. running it, mm-hmm. um, especially in my state. It started – the epidemic really started uh, snowballing, I guess, in 2013, 2014, which also fueled – my desire to put maybe put some of my words out there because I had experience and I wanted to try to create some hope or create some change for families that were in it at that moment. Mm -hmm. And what do you, in your opinion, is there sort of a constellation of events that occurred that heightened the epidemic in 2013, 2014 in the state of New Jersey that you know about? In my opinion, it is um, 20 years of bad mistakes and bad choices, um, 20 years of failures caught up to us around that time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and in, um, in terms of what? In terms of policy, drug policy? and Yes, big mm-hmm. pharma, capping prescriptions. They were running rampant. Our, um, the southern border just is funneling in heroin left and right. But I always argue that the only reason it's funneling in how it how it is is because we gave them the market because the pills are made in our country. They're mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, you're right that they're they're because these these pills, the big pharma. Although it was not big pharma when I was growing up, and again, I'm 10 years older, and I think it's important for every one of our listeners to understand this. I spent most of the beginning of my career convincing people to not feel ashamed of their mental illness because we have these drugs now on the market that would, quote unquote, cure your depression and your anxiety. So we medicated feelings constantly. And mm-hmm. now, again, over the last couple of years, I'll spend the rest of my my career unraveling that and saying, oh, my God, what have we done? that we prescribed all of these pills to all of these people. Now they're massively addicted. They became gateway drugs into people using much heavier things and then creating massive epidemics around the country, especially with young people. Yes. Actually, a new CDC study showed that um, users of prescription drugs are 40 times more likely to use heroin than others. And that figure pretty much cements commonly prescribed medication as a threshold. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Four out of five heroin addicts did use pills first. Wow, that's amazing. Right. So so here we have it, 2013, 2014, you start blogging. And does that blog still exist now or did you? Is I've it- migrated it all to my series, mm-hmm. which my series kicked off in October 2015. Mm-hmm. And but I moved you- some past work into into that series. And tell us what you mean by series so all the listeners understand what you're talking about. Once my writing started getting a response from, from families, I realized that there was a need to keep writing about it, maybe even open a window and let families reach out to me if they wanted me to share their stories in narrative form. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. And it's still happening. So I started the series and I called it the other side of addiction because I wanted families to understand that though you aren't addicted yourself, you're you're in this addiction world. You're just on the other side of it experiencing different things, but still things that are maybe just as painful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's a it's an essay series. And for the most part now it's on the Huffington Post, but on my website I migrate all of my publications to uh this one page on my web page where people could click off and read different things they want to read. And yeah, it's I'm booked right now with interviews through through March. So it hasn't slowed down. Families families still want their story to be heard because they know it can make a difference. So families will reach out to you, they'll tell you their story, you'll interview them, and then you transcribe it and put your creative spin on it and produce back a nonfiction essay about what happened to that particular family. Yes, that's a perfect perfect synopsis. I should steal that next time. <laughs> <laughs> no, your way with words is certainly you you are adept and have a, a gorgeous way with words and so I want to make sure that we um tell our listeners where they can find all of your work because it's incredible, which leads me to obviously the next set of questions, which is what your work actually also does besides helping ease pain and help us put a perspective onto this epidemic around our country that so many families are dealing with. But let's just go back really quickly. So the other side of addiction is your website. And then how I found you was through Instagram. 
Someone said when they found out I was doing a piece on heroin, they said, you know, you really need to check out this girl's Instagram account. And so your Instagram account is incredible because it has snippets of all of your work. And yes, it has snippets of all my poetry and then the headlines of all my my uh, addiction series. Mm-hmm. And did you, is that your largest social media following is on your Instagram account? Or is it, did you have more people visiting your website? Where do you find most of your following going to? It's, it's definitely my, my busy social, my busiest social media platform is my Instagram, but 1.2 million people have read my essay series in one way or another. Oh, that's amazing. Amazing. And Amazingly sad though. Yes. Yes. So that you said that so beautifully before we started recording this call, you said the irony of all of my work is that I wish I almost didn't have to do it basically because there's a bitter sweetness around it. As, as much as it's something beautiful, it's centered around something incredibly painful for people, which is this, this experience. So you wrote a book of poetry and you self-published it and you sold it to all of the people out there who read your work and get so much from it. H- how do you find the time as an artist to be this prolific when you're actually working full time as well? I'm I don't keeping track sleep. of all of this. <laughs> I don't sleep. Um, my drive is literally sometimes my only, I guess, like my only push is the fact that my, my drive has not slowed down because there's so much more I know we need to do as a community and nationally to even get ahead of this epidemic. And, and yeah, I just, I, I sleep when I can, but the cause is my, my main mission at this point. Mm -hmm. I think I also want to make clear a lot of the shows that I've done already for the podcast talk to people who feel as if they're in service to something greater than themselves. And it's huge. I, I didn't have a calling a year ago. I mean, I was a social worker, so my calling was always to help people, but I didn't have that I would look at activists. There's a difference between being in a helping profession and real activists, social activists, and they run on this prana, this energy that just seems otherworldly to me. Mm-hmm. And you think, how do they do this? Like, what is the motivation? And when I started getting closer to those people personally, there was a moment there where I thought, oh, God, I don't want a calling. I don't want to hear it. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be in service because I know I would never sleep again. Right, because once you get your teeth into that mission and you feel like it's you, the, your soul's purpose and it's in your bones, everything else starts to fall away and that becomes such a singular focus. But you, you can accomplish so much and it de- you derive so much pleasure from it, even if it comes from a painful place, it, it, it fills such a need in your life that it's a pretty incredible thing to experience and I always hope and pray now for people to, to be called to service, whatever that service is. But it sounds like you heard your calling and whether you wanted to or not, whether it comes from a place of pain or not, and you're heeding to it almost as if you have no choice as an artist. I, I, I think that is so true. I never really looked at it that way, but I, I absolutely feel like this is what I was meant to to do. I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I always knew, you know, even from a young age, my mother said, you always knew what to say, how to say it, how to express yourself verbally and, and in the written word. And when all this started happening, I just hate to think that families are losing their children, their loved ones in vain. Mm -hmm. And when I lost my cousin, I went on a crazy quest, I guess, for, for understanding of why this had to happen to Jessica, why she came from a good family. She came from my, she's my own blood. Why, why did this happen? And back then I couldn't find any resources that spoke honestly about what the family goes through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I said naively, I said, I'll be that voice. I remember I went home and told my mother, I'm going to start writing about it. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll be the voice for families. And, um, and the rest is, a crazy concoction of timing and, and talent and, and a passion and a true belief that, that these people that suffer from addiction is not a moral failing. They are sick and families need to heal no matter what happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I don't think, I don't think, I mean, to have your voice in the dark out there 
has is an incredible gift to so many already. And I have a feeling that your career has just begun as a writer as well. Um, that you're going to have a long, a long road ahead of you in terms of how much beautiful work you're going to channel into this world. And as much as I hate to say to patients who are in pain or anyone who's gone through this kind of experience that there's a silver lining to it all, like I think that that can be a really hard thing to hear. Obviously, there's not probably one person not listening to this podcast saying if there was one silver line to your cousin's uh, passing through heroin, it's your crusade to change the perception around the drug and to help others not fall into uh, fall into the cracks, so to speak. So if we want to, again, find your work, we go to uh, your Instagram account, which is the Alicia Cook, which I love. <laughs> That's such an awesome name. And we can also go to the other side of addiction. Thank you so much for joining us on Unscripted today. Please again, follow us over at Instagram at Nell Daily, on Facebook at Nell Gibbon Daily. We are creating a really cool tribe over there. And if you have any questions about this episode or any past episodes, whether it's about addiction or love or health in any regard, don't hesitate to email us at Nell, N-E-L-L at the daily.com. I'm still checking. As always, everyone, may the light in me Shine to the light in you. Namaste.